in the position. So we're just going to talk about who we are a little bit, our company. We're going to then go into Ansible on Windows, how it works, what you need, what you can do with it, and why you shouldn't be afraid of it. Um, some lessons we've learned from our own experience. Um, we're really hoping that the demo works. <laughs> Think positive thoughts. And then uh, our parting thoughts. Okay? So let's get into it. So, as I said, we're the Davids. Um, I started playing with a computer back in the early 90s. I had an IBM PC XT, no hard drive. Does anybody remember those? Good, okay, we're in good company. Do you know what would happen if you didn't have a disk in the drive when you booted up the computer? What would it, what would it do? Nothing. Ah, mine did something. It went into basic from ROM. And there was a book from IBM that actually told you how to use BASIC. That's how I learned it. Um, I started learning JavaScript when I was in uh, college, and I've never looked back ever since. So um, basically what I do with Camelot, um, of course, David and I happen to work with small businesses. Um, my passion is um, agile project management, continuous integration, continuous delivery. All that good stuff, Ansible plays into that really nicely. It's not me, sorry. Um, um, 
I'll let David say what he does, and then we'll talk a little bit more about the company, and then that's it. Yeah, it's so very simple. I'm also a small business uh, consultant, just focusing primarily on DevOps and automation. And in my experience, I've found that Ansible has been a very big tool in doing that. It's made it very, very simple. Um, as to some experience with Ansible on Windows, we've had some experience <coughs> using that to for software installation. So, for example, we've done projects in installing Elastic Stack. Um, we've also used Ansible on Windows to install a uh, continuous integration server from the Atlantic, Atlantic Bamboo. Um, so it's been a very big role in uh, in, uh, in help in helping with that. Thank you. So Camelot Consulting Group's been around since about 2005. I joined um, a couple of years ago. This is David's first year. Um, we focus mainly working with small businesses, as I mentioned already. We do agile project management, continuous integration delivery, infrastructure management, and data analysis. The main thing that we try to do is not do people's jobs for them, but to help them learn how to do it themselves. So that's part of why we like to talk about Ansible. It's very easy to learn. You can do a lot of cool stuff with it. And we would love to help you do more. All right, so let's get into the meat of our discussion here, Ansible on Windows. So Ansible has very good module support for Windows. Um, I counted yesterday, and I saw 73 modules. No, 74, sorry. One of them is deprecated, so I can count it, 73. Um, how many people here have experience administrating Windows machines? Right. What's your favorite part about working with Windows? Job Shout security. Out. Job <laughs> security. <That's laughs> Who loves installing software, especially server software? You know, the kind that takes all day? PowerShell. You know? Yeah. <laughs> PowerShell makes a big difference, right? That was a huge breakthrough. I remember sitting down and trying to install SharePoint server without PowerShell. And that was like literally an eight hour process. Yeah. Um, the great thing about Ansible is that it leverages PowerShell. That's what makes it work so good on Windows. Um, but you can do anything you can imagine at a Windows command prompt, you can do through Ansible. You can copy files, you can, there's even a RoboCopy module. Props for RoboCopy. <laughs> Um, you can do, you can set ACLs, you can join a domain, you can set the, uh, the computer <coughs> name, you can reboot the machine, you can install software, uh, you can play with the registry, you can change firewall rules, lots of stuff. And the great thing about Ansible is that you don't have to know PowerShell, you just have to know Ansible, which is really simple <coughs> because all that means is you have to know YAML. Everyone knows YAML, right? Yes. Don't let the name discourage you. It's very simple, very straightforward. Actually, that's really the, one of the biggest things that gets me excited about Ansible with Windows. Windows can be very complicated. I was just talking with Dan earlier. I was a Microsoft guy for a long time, and then I'm not. And now I look back and I think, how did I deal with it? Because I, from my viewpoint, a lot of things with Microsoft are complicated. Um, .NET, to me, is very complicated. And I didn't realize it while I was doing it. It wasn't until I went to the other side, so to speak. <laughs> and now I look back and I'm like, man, how did I do all this stuff? Ansible makes it so much easier. And that's why I'm excited about using it on Windows. Um, so everything you can do from a command prompt or in PowerShell, you can do through Ansible. Of course, it supports Win Command, Win Shell modules. Um, it also has a PS Exec module, so you can do PowerShell remoting. Uh, I didn't actually mention this before, but um, some of the modules give you the ability to set up Windows features. Uh, there's IS modules. Um, you can, there's several different ways that you can install software using Ansible. There's the WinZip module, so you can unzip um, <coughs> archives. You can use the MSI installer. And uh, there's even one, so how many people here have heard of chocolating? Okay, everyone needs to hear about Chocolatey, because Chocolatey changes how you manage Windows. I'm almost excited, as much excited about Chocolatey as about Ansible. But Ansible and Chocolatey really change the way we work with Windows. And so we're going to talk about that tonight, and I hope you guys get into it. 
All right, so what do you need to run Ansible on Windows? You need a Linux node, a management node. So you can't get away with running Ansible directly on Windows. Yes, it's true they're bringing Bash over to Windows, the Linux subsystem, but it's not officially supported by Ansible yet, so you still have to have a Linux machine, but it's okay, you can just spin up a VM, no big deal. It's not so that no dangerous. So, do they talk about that in the documentation? And no, they're not so crazy about that. No, sorry. Hold on one second, let me answer my watch. Um, and then you also need, on that node, you need to have Ansible installed, obviously, to use it, and you need to have PyWinRM, which is the Python library for using uh, Windows Remote. That's how Ansible talks to Windows machines, through WinRM. Uh, the target machine has to have PowerShell 3.0 or, or later. That's pretty much, well, not every Windows machine nowadays, but almost. Um, when does PowerShell 3.0 goes back to like Windows 2008, I think? Roughly, 2005, I'm not sure. But it's fairly safe that you should have, unless you're on XP. <laughs> Uh, you also need to have WinRM enabled and uh, some kind of certificate. You can do self-sign. We're going to show you in the demo how you can enable WinRM and install self-sign cert all in one shot. There's a script that Ansible provides automatically that does the whole thing. It's really simple and straightforward, and you don't really have to know the details. And then you have to have some kind of account that you can log into your machine with. But you have to be able to give that information to Ansible so that it can log into the machine and do what it needs to do. And ideally, that account has the necessary rights to do whatever you're trying. Everything I've said just now is on this page. So you don't have to memorize it. Uh, the docs for Ansible are really good, right? All right? We love the Ansible documentation. It's really nice. And this page goes into everything you need to know Especially if you are in an environment where you need to use uh, NTLM authentication for Ansible or Kerberos, it's covered all in there. Um, it tells you how to get the PowerShell script that we're going to show you in the demo to do the MRM and the self-signed circle. All that's in there. Um, we read this in one day, had something fired up the next, so very straightforward. All right. Let's chat a little bit about best practices. So how many people here have experience actually writing playbooks, whether for Windows or Linux? <coughs> Very good. All right, so how are we going to convince the rest of you guys? You're coming to Ansible Meetups, you need to use Ansible. <laughs> um, so the best practices for Windows are basically the same as you have for Linux as far as organizing your your, uh, your playbooks, and you don't want to rely too heavily on the command modules. You want to use the ones that are built in with Ansible. Um, you're going to have a windows.yaml file that has your variables so that Ansible knows how to connect to your Windows machine. In the demo, we're going to show you we have that file. And it has like the, we're using a local account. So we've got the username and password. We're telling it to use which port for WinRM that sort of thing. Because as we know, or as you should, you might know, Ansible by default works with Linux, uses SSH. And it knows all those details already. But for Windows, you have to tell it we're using WinRM instead. Now in Windows, we're all used to writing our username and password on a post-it note and sticking it to our monitor, right? <laughs> I know <laughs> You just test one, you Kind of slide underneath, right? Yeah. I don't want to find it there. Um, so with Ansible, if you're writing playbooks and you've got your variables and you've got your usernames and accounts and clear text, not necessarily such a great idea. We did the demo, of course. We always do it the demo. But uh, in real life, you should secure user credentials. Um, do you guys know much about Ansible Vault? 
I've never done anything with it. Yeah, um, yeah. There's also lookup plugins for things like HashiCorp Vault and other sort of like secret management systems. So it's pretty easy to write your own lookup plugin as well. If you want to do that. But uh, the Vault stuff is pretty easy. Uh, there's a couple of commands, and then, uh, you typically want to generate a really long password or something and store that somewhere. But uh, and then you can just a command line flag to to do that. And you typically create your group bars, and you'll have like a bars.yaml file, and then. Um, Gosh, what's the other one? A vault. I think it's just like vault.yaml or something, and that's the encrypted part, and it knows how to decrypt that. It, but yeah, it's, it's it's not that hard. It's, I use it a lot. Myself. Essentially, I think it, what it does is it takes a, a, a string mm -hmm. as a password and uses that um, to encrypt yeah. your variables. And so um, the key with using Ansible vault is that you want to make sure that your variables. Um, are separate from the actual sequence because the sequence will be encrypted, so it's really hard to track via um, uh, sort of source control. And uh, actually, recently I just at my work um, implemented something where I used uh, Amazon's KMS, where uh, I used the KMS to go ahead and have a script to call a KMS, and it will retrieve some kind of bare string back. Um, and this way, I will actually be able to record whoever it is that actually has access to the to the um, the password itself, so it's kind of cool. Anyway, yeah, yeah. So um, security is not just for the Linux dorks. <laughs> it's also for Windows people too. We should, we should, we should, we should have a definitely have a lookup that looks up things underneath the keyboard or right on the monitor. <laughs> yeah, right. yeah right. bring in the latest version of AI. Have the camera that reads the person. <laughs> exactly. Uh, have it's your eyes on the passwords and then your. Alright, who here has a development background? Who writes code? You do. You never, you never stop being a developer. Seriously, once a developer, always a developer. So, do you guys write readmes yes. for your code? Do you write change logs? No. What's the documentation? Uh, yeah, okay, okay, all right, all right. So, um, DevOps, right? DevOps, the marriage between development and operations. Developers are supposed to think like operators, and operators are supposed to think like developers. So, since you're working with Ansible, you're writing code, that means you're developing. And if you're a good developer, you create documentation. You don't have to create lots of documentation. <coughs> and the YAML, when you read it, is very self-documenting. You don't have to go into all the details about what the code does. But it's nice to have something to remind you why you did certain things and how somebody else could do your job in case you don't need to show up the next time. Uh, so I'm a big documentation guy. I think it's really important. So as far as I'm concerned, best practice, you should have a readme, you should have a change log, and you should be checking your code into source code. Because the YAML file is just like any other any other code. It's going to go through multiple revisions. You're going to add things. They're not going to work. You're going to take them away. You're going to put them back. Sort of control your friend, as far as I'm concerned. All right. Lessons from the field. I'm going to turn the mic over to David. Hi, I'm David. <laughs> yeah, so lessons from the field. Um, one of the things that, uh, that Dave and I have actually had a lot of, uh, where we found a lot of help with a tool that we've used a lot with Ansible. Is anybody familiar with Vagrant? Yeah. So I, I have some people, for some people who don't uh, know what Vagrant is, Vagrant is an open source tool that uh, builds VM environments uh, in a single workflow and it, it manages them as well. Development time is very easy. You can spin them up and tear them down. So one of the great things, um, along with Ansible, to have a pre-packaged management node that goes up with Vagrant that has Ansible installed already um, is fantastic. It's up, in, it's up in minutes, all goes under the hood. Um, and you can start working with Ansible right off the bat. Um, one other great thing, too, um, how many people like to run tests on physical machines? <laughs> Introduction, <laughs> right? Yeah. yeah. Just like going to run that's the goal. That's the goal. Um, one of the great things about Vagrant is the ability to spin up VM. Something goes wrong, tear it down, spin it back up again. 
you have a lot of control with it. Um, one of the things that I like on the Vagrant website, it says that the it worked on my computer excuse is a relic would be a relic of the past um, because you can easy, very easily test one playbooks. You can spin up Windows machines. It's very very simple. Um, one of the great things too, as as we talked about, kind of goes along kind of with the best practices. Um, what we've learned or have had some experience with with Ansible playbooks, just organizing them by roles. I know that. Some people have worked with Ansible before, so you kind of know what I'm talking about. But just to organize your playbooks. So we talked about before a project that we did was uh, installing the Elastic Stash, Elastic Stack. So separating Elastic Search as one role, Log Stash as another role. That really makes troubleshooting, testing a lot easier. And to have just one massive playbook can be a really big headache. Um, so that's one thing that we really push is to organize by roles. Um, one thing we talked about too, as we talked about using Chopity before. Um, for those who don't know what Chopity is, it is a command line installer for Windows. Um, and the documentation, um, what's on the Chopity website, if you want to take a look at it afterwards, there's thousands of programs and packages that you can use that Ansible will gladly do for you. One of the great things um, that Ansible does is if Chocolaty is not installed on the on the node that you're pushing to, it will install it for you. So it is it's it's a really great tool that uh, that you can use just to just to, uh, for software installation. And one of the things too that we talked about documentation and source control. Some experience that we've had is it is a it saves a lot of headache just taking five minutes to write things down um, so that we don't have to keep go searching for uh, searching for where where we went wrong or what we changed. So that is something that, from experience, we really want to push other people. Um, so that we really def definitely recommend. Yeah, I just one The great thing about source control, um, especially if you're using distributed source control, I'm not talking like visual source safe. <laughs> yeah, so like a real uh, version control system, like GitHub, or Git, really. Git is the version control system. GitHub is what hosts it in the cloud. Um, I've used Mercurial as well as Git. Um, the great thing is with a distributed version control system is you can actually have different people working on the same thing at the same time. And somebody can try one thing out, somebody can try something else, you can merge it later. It's a lot easier to work in parallel. Um, yeah. That's all. That was my yeah. So let's see. Where, okay. Oh. <laughs> yeah, uh, now I get to the hard part. Demo. All right. So I think one thing that I'll do first, right off the bat, is just walk you guys through what um, we were talking about in terms of having a prepackaged management node and, and what our playbooks look like. Um, so this is what YAML looks like. It's pretty straightforward. I'm actually going to turn it to increase. Uh, you think that I would have since I'm a partner. Yeah, that one. Thank you. Yeah, plus, 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 plus. There we go. Okay, much better. Thank you. Maybe a little bit bigger. Okay. A little bit bigger. Yeah, that's good. There we go. Okay. Nice to actually see it. So, uh, YAML is kind of like JSON, but like a little less verbose. Um, so, JSON is less verbose than XML, and YAML is less verbose than JSON. I don't think we can get any less for those. Um, so one of the things we were talking about before is about using polls. Um, for the host, you're indicating what machines you're targeting. Um, in this example, we're just targeting a Windows machine. This was just done as a proof of concept. But you could have different types of machines that you're targeting, like your production servers, your staging servers, your web service versus your DB servers. Um, you can you can slice and dice things in a certain way so that even if you have a large inventory of machines, you can tell Ansible exactly where you want to go and what you want it to touch. Um, and then we talked about those roles. So has anyone ever heard of the Elastic Stack before? Elastic Search fans? So the group that I was working with, they wanted to install Elastic Search by hand on a Windows 2012 machine. And then they were going to like create a farm 
more by hand. So this is the reason why this exists, because I wanted to prove to them that they could do it in five minutes using Ansible instead of by hand. Um, so there's a couple of things I'll just show you really quick, like the common. So this is like where all your prerequisites go. You need to make sure you have Java. We're using the Win Chocolatey module. That's the thing that uses Chocolatey to install software. The great thing about Chocolatey installs everything unattended. Uh, and when you look at the Chocolatey site, if you look at the different packages it has, which there are thousands now, um, it tells you which settings or configuration changes you can make through the way. But it's great, you don't actually have to babysit it. Uh, we make sure that net.net 4.5 is installed. We make sure that our folder where we're going to install the software is there. And the place where we're going to download the zip files. Because Elasticsearch is, wasn't really originally intended to run on Windows. It was more a Linux thing. So they don't have like this super fancy installer. We just download and go. We're downloading a zip file when we install Elasticsearch. So we make sure that there's a place to put it, and that way when this role is called, it knows that it's going to find that folder already. So Ansible is like, uh, you're describing the state that you want the machine to be in, right? So when this runs, if that folder already exists, it's not gonna recreate it because it checks to make sure it's there or not first. If it's not there, then it does create it. And the reason why, we, and then that way, when we write our other role, we can rely on the fact that it's there. We're doing this here. We can get URL that downloads the file from the internet. So we're downloading this Elasticsearch archive. We're saving it here, and then we're checking a couple of facts. So if Elasticsearch was already installed, and we're rerunning the playbook, you want to make sure that. Um, If there's any existing files, remove them, yada, yada, blah, blah. You can do very, I don't want to say simple, because it's not simple, but you can do straightforward logic in Ansible playbooks. So you can check to see what the state of the system is in certain respects, and then based on that, do some plays and not others, or some tasks, I should say, and not others. Um, and then you install it. So this is an example of calling PowerShell in Ansible. You use the win command module, you call PowerShell.exe, and it's just like you typed it in the command line. Same exact thing, I just copied and pasted here. I did it manually to make sure it worked, and then I just copied and pasted it. And that's all you have to do. So what this is doing here is, this is, I'm actually using PowerShell to unzip the zip file. And then it extracts it to that folder. Pretty straightforward. So what we did was we broke this down so that we have, so we've got the elastic search, and we have another role for Kibana, and then there's another role for Logstash. Uh, using Ansible, we can also push out all the configuration files for Elastic. So there are a couple of um, they're not JSON, I forget what the configuration files for Elastic are. They are YAML as well. They are YAML? Yeah. Um, so what we can do is we can put the configuration files that we know we're going to end up having on the server in this repo, so they can be versioned as well. And then after we've installed the software, we can tell it to copy the configuration files over. Then we can tell it to restart the server, start the services, and boom, you go. It's very straightforward. So the nice thing, as David was mentioning earlier, the nice thing about breaking these things out into separate roles is that we could make sure that each one worked before we moved on to the next one, which is really helpful when it comes to troubleshooting. Um, <laughs> I really have to remind myself to just take one step at a time. Because when you find a problem, you have no idea how back, far back you have to go. So I'm lying to everything. And so, getting back to the, the main site file, it calls those roles, which installs all the software, then it, you would have your task here to copy your configuration files, you set up Elasticsearch as a service, 
So, I don't know if you knew this, but the cool thing about Ansible is that it supports NSSM, the non-sucking service manager. Has anyone heard about that one? I heard about it. <laughs> I heard about it from Elastic. I, I had never heard seen that before until I saw Elastic, and then I'm like, oh, they use the non-sucking service manager. Okay. <coughs> there it is. NSSM. So, um, that's what makes it easier to install and start stop services in Windows. It's already dead simple if you're on Linux, but Windows is a little bit more complicated, as I mentioned earlier, more complicated. So we have all the Ansible stuff here in this folder called Site. And then right next to that folder, we have another one called Management Node. And that's where we have our Vagrant file. And this is the thing that spins up the Management Node that gives us everything that we need in order to actually run the playbook. So we don't actually have to have a dedicated Linux machine. We don't have to use up valuable resources. We don't have to do any of that. I can run it straight from my laptop. I just vagrant up. I get the machine. When the machine starts up, they automatically install everything I need to run Ansible, and we're done. And then when I SSH into this vagrant machine, it gives me uh, a path straight into the site folder, which is all this stuff, so that I can just <coughs> cd slash Ansible, and I can get to my playbooks and run them. It's really simple. And in fact, ooh, maybe I can do that. That's exactly what I did here. This is the, the result of my, my vagrant up command. It installed all the stuff, and then I go vagrant ssh. I get in the machine, boom, I do cd ansible cd. So you can see there, I know that's really super small, I'm sorry. Host, roles, site dynamic which is the same exact thing that I have on my machine, my little machine, in that folder there. Command plus plus. Enlarge it. Terminal. Sure. Command. Plus plus. Yay. Do you, you, you think I want? <laughs> I've only owned this for like a year. <coughs> Sorry. You, it's okay. You know and I really have to do it for myself. Um, okay. So there, you can see that better now. So now, what I can do is, if I wanted to, and I can't right now, I'll wait a second, but it's just a simple matter of saying Ansible, Playbook, okay. and I do I, I do hosts, hosts, that's my inventory file, and then I can do site, .yaml. And I hit enter, and it does it. Um, I don't know if this is going to work because, oh, you know what, here, let's do this. So we have to go back to our VM. I have a VM for Windows here. Let me just bring it up here. So this is a bare bones Windows 2012 R2 server. It's got, it's, uh, so it's Windows Core, there's no GUI. Uh, and then basically, what I wanted to do was, let me just show you really quick. I'm going to bounce over to the docs file that I was referring to before. So if we go here to... These are all our Windows modules, which is all the stuff that you can do with Ansible Windows. And if we go here to... Windows support, here we go. This is the stuff that I was talking about before. This is the page that I was referring to in the slide presentation. It has all the stuff that you need in order to get Ansible running on Windows. There's more than you really need. You just have to pick and choose. And then I wanted to find, oh, here we go, Windows System Prep. So this is talking about what you need to do in order to get Ansible to run on the Windows machine. And, all right. Where is it? Where is it? Where are you? 
Okay. Oh, here we go. This is the PowerShell script that they've provided that sets up your WinRM and does the self-signed cert. So you need to. To I'm not going to type this whole thing. It's going to be way too hard for me one-handed. I, I did realize how difficult it was to hold a microphone and type at the same time. Sorry. Hey, there's a there's a mic stand right in front of you. Right there. there is. Oh, I could give it to David. He could talk. Oh, that works. And then I can type. Yeah, that works too. Yeah, brilliant. I've been doing a lot already. <laughs> <laughs> to have real copy paste work. I hate using uh, user content because I cannot copy paste. Cancel all, cancel all, dev, sorry, develop, examples. You'd think they'd have like a little Google or a short dot GL, right? Like for this, but they don't. Examples, scripts, Of course, you have to have the correct pieces. Sets up your firewall rules, it creates a self signed cert, it tells WinRM to use the self signed cert, and then it works. Trust me. It works. I know because I did it. So, the example that I had was I was trying to do this proof of concept for the company that I was working with, and so they, they wanted to just install the Elk stack, they did it themselves and took this guy all day. I walked in with this stuff. I set up the laptop, made sure everything was working. I hit go, and it literally was done in less than 10 minutes, the whole thing. He wasn't too impressed, unfortunately. <laughs> He's like, well, we have PowerShell. I'm like, I know, but we have Ansible. We can use Ansible, and there's a reason why I think Ansible is better than PowerShell. We'll talk about it in a few minutes, but, um, but it was just so nice to just hit the button, and it was done. Let's get back to our presentation and demo time is over. Sorry. Right. So why is Ansible better than PowerShell? Do we have, does everyone understand why PowerShell is better than Batch Class? That's pretty straightforward, right? Yeah. So the reason why Ansible is better than PowerShell, so I've written PowerShell scripts before. And I've, I've even tried to write PowerShell scripts that do things like install software and set configurations in them. Um, and so the trouble with writing PowerShell is that it's super easy to just spit up commands and you find them on the internet and copy paste and you expect everything to work because you're a developer and you think that everything you write is awesome and perfect. And you're like, yeah, I just copy paste this and type it and do it. And then 
then what happens when it doesn't work and there's an error? Uh, you, know, you gotta go back and you gotta do And you're going online, you're this, you're that, and blah, blah, blah. And then you realize, well, if I'm gonna write PowerShell, I have to write my own error handling code. And then if I'm, if I'm catching errors, then I need to find out which errors they are, and if they're fatal or not. And if they're not fatal, do I spit out a message as a warning? Do I use verbose? And you have to think about all this stuff. But the great thing about Ansible is they've already done that. So you write an Ansible script, it uses PowerShell, and it already knows what's a fatal error, what's not a fatal error. It already knows if this happens, like for example, as David was talking about, if you use Chocolatey. If Chocolatey is installed, no big deal, it installs it for you. Done. Um, so I sat and I thought, like, why, why not use PowerShell? Well, Ansible just makes it easier. And you don't really have to know PowerShell. You don't have to go crazy reading the scripting guy's blog. You've done that. So it, you just have to understand how the modules work. You read the Ansible documentation. It's very straightforward, the YAML, and it just works. So that's why. Uh, so therefore, in my opinion, and in David's, right, Ansible makes managing Windows so much more tolerable. I mean, we've all, for those of us who have worked with Windows, we know the difference between a good day and a bad day on Windows. And we know that things just take time, unfortunately. But man, Ansible takes away that whole time factor because we don't have to do things manually. So many things in Windows are done manually and that's why it's so time consuming. So the great thing about Ansible is it takes that away. And Ansible really isn't that hard to learn. Um, I've only been, I don't want to say only, uh, I started working with Ansible a little over a year ago. My colleague, who has much more experience with it, introduced me to it. And I saw it, and he walked me through my first Ansible playbook, it was very straightforward. And this year we worked, David has been working with Ansible for... About a year as well, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and how long did it take you to figure it out? I was up with Ansible with my... Like it, was, it was very, very, very simple. Yeah, it's very straightforward. You don't have to have a master's degree in Microsoft knowledge to be able to figure out how to use Ansible on Windows. It's very straightforward. Ansible works with Azure. We've done it, been there, done that. Um, one of our clients, the one that we did the installation of the continuous integration server, that is actually running in Azure. Is a VM in Azure that's running their continuous integration server. We used Ansible to create the resources in Azure. The VM is actually created by an Ansible script. And then we used another Ansible script to install the software on the VM that was created by Ansible in Azure. Yeah, right. So that's really cool. Uh, Ansible has lots of great support for AWS too. The support for Azure isn't quite as good as the support for AWS, but that's only because AWS has been around for a lot longer. Um, AWS is, some people would argue, is a much more mature product than Azure. Things are changing with Azure very quickly. Um, but you can still do things in it, and that's nice. I was gonna to say too, the great thing about Ansible is that it's really community driven. So um, people who know Python, are able to write modules for it, and the documentation as per, um, let's say like just for this example for Azure, is, is building every single day. So it's this ever-growing thing that just is just getting better, um, but it really a lot, it really uh, takes in the community a lot as well um, to help to help build it. Um, so it's, it's a very, very nice thing to be, to be a part of. Right, cool, thank you. Uh, and did I mention documentation? Sorry, it's my little, uh, it's my one weakness, documentation, and source control. I think, I don't know how I lived before I learned about source control, but now that I know it, it's totally changed the way that I've developed. And I really think that it has a lot of benefit for operations, especially if you're doing things with Ansible. And that's it. Anybody want to have questions? Yes. yes. What are some of the bigger features? What are some of the bigger features that are still missing in Ansible for Windows support? Yeah. 
Yeah, I don't know. I can't think. I mean, I, okay, so he said that there's only 73 modules, but with those 73 modules, you can really do a lot of stuff. Um, I think the biggest thing um, that I found with Ansible, again, is installing software. That's the huge pain with Windows, is installing software. And if you have Ansible and you combine it with either archives, zip archives, or chocolatey, that's to me like 90% of the, the issues that, that people face. So there's ways to, as I mentioned, you can add uh, machines to a domain using Ansible. You can set permissions on files. Um, you can manage services, well you can manage services using NSSM. Um, I just want to note too, I really re recommend checking out the Ansible website um, just to see what um, what support they have for Windows because they, they do a really good job of explaining it. And also as was said also as was said was said before that um, I will always at the last case resort they have that command uh, module where you can stick whatever you're gonna stick to a command line or in PowerShell in, in through Ansible. Not highly recommended, but I, I would really I would really take a look at the website to see um, to see that type of support. Yeah, and even the stuff that it works with um, IIS. And I mean, it does, you've got, so you've got the domain stuff here, you've got when to frag, you can defrag the hard drive. I mean, I wouldn't have thought you'd be chanceable for that, but why not? Sure. You can copy files, um, you can work with the event log. Um, you can actually invoke PowerShell DSC configuration, so you can use PowerShell desired state through Ansible. Um, as I mentioned earlier, you have the, um, the firewall stuff. Um, you can do um, installation of hotfixes. You can get a list of which hotfixes are installed, but you can actually get a, as far as, um, I've never done it myself, but you can get like a list of what's already installed and then based on that, take certain actions. Um, you can work with IIS, as I mentioned. You can do map drives, NSSM. You can work with a page file. Um, you can change the power plan. There's a thing for rebooting the machine. You can work with the registry editor. Robocop, there's actually a Robocopy module. So you don't even have to call Robocopy using the win command. You can use win Robocopy. <laughs> Text-to-speech module, win set. Um, you, can, you can use win service, but of course it also has the NSSM. You can work with temp files, shortcuts, uh, execute shell commands, unzip files. I was using PowerShell to do that, but they also have an unzip module. Um, you can change the time zone on the machine. You know. Will you, will you say that, given what you just talked about, which is you would recommend actually the Win NSSM to manage the services over Win services, or have you any experience with that? So. We used NSM because, and SSM, because for the Elastic stack, uh, if you're installing Elastic as a service, you're using the batch file that comes with Elastic. Um, there isn't like a, there isn't like a, like you don't install Elastic on a Windows machine as a service. It's not that easy. So you use NSSM to kind of like wrap the batch file, and it takes care of starting it automatically whenever you restart the machine. So in that particular instance, we used NSSM. But if you're just working with Windows services directly, then you can use the, um, the module. Yeah. NSSM is really, I don't know what to call it exactly. It's like, a, not a band-aid, but like a, a wrapper. It's a wrapper for things that don't, because writing, Programs to be Windows services or not? It's not straightforward. It's really not. Nice. So, yes. So, so this question is the question basically has to do, uh, do with the, the concept of like a sudo or a root in uh, Linux, right? How does that translate to the Windows environment? In a sense, do you have two levels of access in Windows, or this WinRA and you just have one single level of access, and you just go in and do the all back with that? Yeah. So, so when we mentioned in there prerequisites, you have to have an account that Ansible is using to connect to the machine. So in your, in, in the, I'll just show you really quickly here, if we go into the, the windows, so here, you have to set up the, the Ansible user and the Ansible password, um, and then you tell it to use the 
support 96, 90, sorry, 5986, and that you're using WinRM, uh, so it doesn't do, try to SSH into the Windows machine. Um, so in this example, we're using a local administrator account, and we're just specifying the username and password, we're not using Ansible Vault or anything, it's just a demo. Um, but you can also use Kerberos if you have a domain account that you want to attach to, to the machine. And you can, uh, I haven't done this myself, but the way that I understand the way that PS exec works, you can connect as one user, but then PS exec can execute code as a different one. So. Um, actually, uh, if for folks who are, I think I've dragged enough folks here who are apparently first time Ansible users. So how would you recommend if they wanted to, as their first step, to do Ansible uh, with Windows? Like, talk about a little bit about your experience with the very first thing you've done sure. with Ansible and Windows. Yeah, yeah. So the very first thing I did was go to the documentation, uh, Windows support, and I just, I just walked through this, honestly. Um, the nice thing it is, is it tells you how to do your system prep. So, um, you have to have a control machine. You have to have a Linux control machine, right? So that's step number one. And that has to have Ansible and Pi and WinRM installed, right? We're talking about those prerequisites. So you have to have that kind of off the bat. Um, and one thing that it would help you with that is if, for example, you had Vagrant and VirtualBox or VMware or whatever, you can just grab the Vagrant file, spin it up, and it's ready to go. Um, but if you go into here, I'm going to show you actually, there's like a, I need to find, there it is. Let me just zoom in here really fast. So there's this module called WinPane, and that's basically designed just to make sure that Ansible can talk to the Windows machine that you're trying to reach. And so if you if you walk through this stuff and you finally then you get down to this point, you, see, you, you can have a, like a very simple inventory file. I'll show you a very simple inventory file. You can just hard code the um, the IP address that you're trying to reach. So. Uh, you set up your VM or whatever that, that you're testing, you're playing with. You drop your IP address into a host file. You specify that in your inventory. And then you just run the, the win ping command. And if it works, it'll say palm. And boom, you're good to go. So um, that actually sounds like an excellent idea for something on GitHub. <laughs> A Windows starter kit. Wow, good idea. Glad I thought of it. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> okay, so yeah, that's something that we actually put together. It's not such a bad idea. Um, but that's basically all I did. I went to this page. I started reading about it. I kind of had a bit of a head start because I already knew what to do with the Linux machine to start up with. Um, but. As soon as I understood how to set the, the host file with the inventory, the IP address, and I did the win payments. Once you got that, then everything is golden. Yes? Um, let's just say you have a company that has a, that is solely a window shop, and they have you know, it's already a CCM setup, or good, enough of a PowerShell or DSC setup, with, you know, package on, already automated. Why, let's just say, for example, why go Ansible? Why not, you know, you Either would they're happy with what they already have, why not? If they were, you know, would they maybe go to want to let, let's say puppet or chef or anything rather than let's say answer? Well, what was your opinion to it that? Yeah. Okay. So, good question. Um, so I've worked with PowerShell, and my opinion is that Ansible has a much easier learning curve. Um, I actually don't mind. So I, 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 I literally programmed in probably like two dozen languages. Like I'm not paying not learning another one. Um, so I'm okay with not really knowing PowerShell that well. Um, but the really nice thing is like, um, so Chef and Puppet have um, 
a certain amount of market share in comparison to Ansible. But the really nice thing about Ansible is that it's agentless. You don't have to have any software installed on the target machines. You have to have a management node, and it has to run Linux. So OK, you have to deal with that. But then you don't have to deal with anything on the end machines. The only thing that you have to do is you have to run that PowerShell script that sets up the around. So OK, there's one thing you have to do. But you have to take a few minutes to set up the VM anyways. <laughs> What's the big deal about logging in and running another PowerShell script? Yeah, I was going to say, too, uh, one of the things that they uh, also said at the Ansible Augments uh, back in December, use both. If, if your company is using Chef or Puppet, that's great. Use that for this one thing. Well, let's use Ansible for this, for this other. Recommend that um, if, if you'd like. And then show them the, the good side of Ansible. Um, and then you know, eat, sort of ease them into that if, if you'd like it. That's, to, that's just one approach um, to doing that. It's just, just a recommendation. Yeah. Right. yeah, thank you. Yeah. And like I said, the, the, one of the companies that I work with, um, they're big on PowerShell. And they think that that's what they're going to use to manage their stuff. Okay, but if you're going to ask me to do it, then I'm using it. It's just easier. But then again, like David was saying, what they talked about at Ansible Automates is um, one of the best ways to do it is pick something straightforward and easy and just demo it and see what happens. I mean, a lot of times these decisions aren't really on hands, right? Unfortunately. Actually, yeah, if you want to do talk to Dan over there. Um, he actually has experience using um, Ansible with Chef. And I think uh, he kind of got frustrated with the Chef's installation at his um, last job, was it? And uh, he just got fed up. So he's just like, I'm going to just do it with Ansible. So no, I'm just curious, because let's just say somebody had, is wanting, you know, like I mentioned, like a CCM shop or a partial, and they have things automated to, to an empty degree, and they want to introduce an open source management tool. Why would they choose, you know, out of the major three, why choose Ansible other than the other two, or, and, or even you wipe out what they already have implemented in terms of a CCM or PowerShell, and this is, and we invented, you know, we invented you with some other platform? Uh, actually, the answer to that one is kind of easy, because um, YAML is easier to read than PowerShell, period. So, you, you are running a shop on Windows, and you happen to have a bunch of interns and, and like, um, you know, like people who are students, and or basically someone who's just not very technical, probably knows how to do a little bit of Excel programming, maybe. Um, you give it to them, and they're a little bit enterprising enough that you can figure it out. Um, and the... Yeah, just by way of example. And, and also, uh, the other thing is that, uh, as David said, that there's not a whole lot of um, error exception handling that you have to do in order to get that done. And you'll find that you end up basically doing it way easier um, and, and do it on multiple machines with, with one simple command. Like, um, you actually flip back to the ping command. Just wanted to show that. Um, so the ping command, that one's what they call in Ansible world a uh, one-off. Uh, which essentially speaking, dash M means the module that you're using, um, and dash I is the inventory, and then you do a dash A command. And so if you want to run that across, like, you have 80 Windows servers, and you just want to get a state of something, like just today I have to patch a bunch of Linux servers, um, and I want to make sure all the kernels are upgraded to 4.4.10. So I just go Ansible, um, the host name, which is all, and dash I is like production or staging, um, and dash M command for module, and dash A for you name dash R. And it prints out, boom. Ones that are reachable, they tell you it's not reachable. Ones that are, you know, um, it would just give you a nice, simple, and very easy to see, straightforward, one command, boom, you're done with 80, 80 ghosts. So. Yeah, that, that reminds me. So, 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 Ansible, like on one machine, is not the same as Ansible at scale when you're managing a whole farm of machines. And that's where you really find the value in Ansible. And um, so that's what Connie's talking about. You can like hit 80 servers with one command and you get all this information. 
The other thing that's really simple and something that they were bringing up during the Ansible automates um, was that you can give people who don't have the same technical proficiency as the really high paid IT guys, that's us, right? Uh, and they can do this. Like this is, this is something that, I'm not gonna say like every Joe off the street can do, but you don't have to. See the thing with, the thing with being lean and agile is that the people who are really talented and have very high skill sets, you want to maximize their value in the organization. <coughs> and unfortunately, like installing software and taking care of servers, that's not maximizing our value, right? For, for those of us that have this certain experience or knowledge set, right? So um, the great thing about automation is that you get a machine to do something that you would be paying a person a lot of money to take care of. It doesn't actually require them to do a lot of, depends, thinking, but you know what I'm trying to say. So this is about freeing people up to do what they're really paid for, to maximize their value to the organization. And Ansible really helps with that a lot. Yeah, and um, I remember Brian Coco was doing one of the Ansible developers. Um, I remember the very first uh, meetup he he talked about how he had the script and every day he was like some sort of contracting at some bank he hated it but anyway he one of the one of the tasks he had to do was every day walk in the morning and say like generate this report and he just kind of got tired of having to do it so what he did was he created an asshole um, uh, playbook and just handed it to some secretary to do it. <laughs> and the coach is like, you go there, you SSH here, and you run this command, boom, done. And then they take care of themselves. And, then, and the script or the playbook automatically emails a report to everybody. And that's pretty much what they were talking about, which is basically handing something that's really repeatable, that is dumb, that's really simple to do, but without having to explain it if something goes wrong. Um, and you know, and without having to actually dig into it and just tell them, hey, you know, you just modify this here, and it'll work, and that's that's quite valuable. But if you combine that with Jenkins, you don't need any people, right? Yeah, that's very good point. So, so you need people to do creative things. For example, programming. <laughs> programming is actually a creative activity because um, when we program. We're specifically writing things to solve a very specific problem. And we have to decide what's the best solution. And that takes creativity. Um, we may not think of code as a creative output, but it really is. And especially because we don't write the same code every single time. And we look at code that we wrote three years ago, and we're like, what? <laughs> I could do that so much better. So it's important to use people for creative activities, because that's not what machines do. It's good to use machines for repetitive, automated, or repetitive, boring tasks because people are bad at that. They don't want to do boring tasks, right? Who wants to file taxes? No, there's no creativity. Would taxes. you define Ansible as a programming language? Uh, yeah, well, I mean, it's like HTML. Is HTML really a programming language? Somewhere in between. Somewhere there, in between, right? I don't think it's Turing complete, but you do have conditionals, you do have variables, you do have, um, in some ways, like inheritance with roles, right? So it has some of some of the concepts of programming language. I, I guess I don't think it's Turing complete. I don't know, Tim, is it Turing complete? I don't think it's quite there. By the way, Tim Abno, he's a product manager for, for uh, Ansible, it's here, so. If you have any very specific questions, you might be able to help. But yeah, I mean, it's close. It's very close to a full programming language. So you have, like I said, you have conditionals, you have loops, you have error handling, uh, you have retry logic, uh, you, have, and you have all of that stuff that you normally put into your own shell scripts, but now it's consistent, and you can apply it to every task that you have. So. Technically, YAML itself doesn't do that. Right. YAML oh, yeah, is just a declarative answer. language, yeah. right? It's how Ansible reads the YAML. Yeah. The great thing about YAML, I'm sorry, <laughs> YAML, is that uh, it's so human readable. It's very readable. Um, like that's what made JSON better than XML, right? It wasn't so confusing to look at. And that's what makes YAML in some ways better than JSON. I'm still a JSON guy myself, but I can understand why YAML is so popular. It's very readable. Let, um, me, uh, let me ask you a question. Yeah. The, the sidebar they show with this uh, folders and files, right? Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. 
Yep. So basically, uh, this reminds me of the, the C program I showed, the make file. So when you start to get real complicated, you're going to get lost in this jungle. You can. So, so that's one of the great things about using rules. And Ansible has, so what is it, Ansible Galaxy? The prepackaged roles, right? So um, you can leverage roles that other people have built. They're open source, they're available on this uh, Ansible Galaxy. And so um, if you, uh, so that's one way of getting around it. The other way, but the reason why we did it this way is because it's important to work on one piece at a time. And then, and then kind of put them together. And if you go to the Ansible docs and go to the best practices page, this is, this is more or less what they show. In fact, I actually changed what I had to make it match what they have. <laughs> because I wanted to actually illustrate it. So, if you're... The nice thing about working with folders, right, is that you can, only, you can, you can focus in on the one that you're interested in. I have it all open because I was flipping back and forth between the files, right? But, okay, so you've got your management node and you've got your site. In your site, you've got your host and your roles and you're trying to figure out what's going on with Elasticsearch, so you get into roles, and then you go into Elasticsearch. Um, I guess it depends on whether you're a type A person or not. I mean, I would, I would just say that roles are kind of like libraries. Yeah. That's the best, better way of actually thinking about it in terms of server roles, which is slightly different. Yeah. yeah. yeah the nice thing about roles um, is that you can, when you modularize things, you can be much more specific about what you're applying where. And that's, that's nice. Because, so the idea of having your site is that you're literally describing what makes up your entire site, all of the servers, right? And so then you need to break down and say which servers get these pieces and which servers get those pieces. It's kind of like you're trying to show how, how all the different pieces make up the mosaic. Is that kind of it? Any questions? Actually, one more. Um, the thing is, I was wondering, since you're running as well as Windows, what's the biggest issues that you have run into? That you have face dealing <laughs> inside that. <laughs> because I'm guessing, you know, you're, you're running Ansible again to your name stack. It's the next to not talk into the next usually issues are much mm -hmm. less complex. But when you're dealing with putting into Windows perspective, I was wondering what's scenarios that you have run into, or run into in terms of either setup or troubleshooting, but let's say you're deploying a playbook and it's not responding on your host. Right. Or, or, or it's not doing this, uh, uh, not automating as the way that you, you intended. What kind of issues have you run into and how do you troubleshoot it? Yeah, okay. So I find that the, really the only issues that I've had, had is, is in connecting, like specifying the host properly and making sure that I'm actually connecting to the machine. And that's why that min ping module comes in so handy, because I can just make sure that I'm actually talking to the machine. We had that issue at some point in time, right? We were just trying to figure out how to get to the machine. But um, once you get there, once you know that you have connectivity, right? Uh, so let me just do a quick example. So um, has anybody done anything with Atlassian Bamboo? Any Atlassian folks here, fans? Damn, good. Good. Ansible is great. So is Atlassian. Okay, so if you wanted to install Atlassian Bamboo, I'm just going to show you here. Right? They've got a whole page here, Atlassian documentation, installing Bamboo on Windows. So when we had to write our Ansible playbook, we went here. We followed these steps. We didn't use the one using the Windows installer. We did the one using the zip archive. So we just opened that up. And literally, these steps became the tasks that we wrote in our playbook. There's just a one-to-one -one correlation. So we extract the files. That's what our playbook does after it downloads it. Uh, we had to set up the Bamboo home directory. Our playbook does that. Um, we have to make sure that, well, of course, we're installing Jira, right? So, I mean, Java. So, when you install Java, you have to make sure your Java home environment variable is set. 
Well, that's in our playbook. So we literally just went one by one. They told us what to do. And we one by one just wrote the place for each step. And it just works. I guess the, just to wrap up, like an answer to your question, I, on the Ansible side for Windows, we really haven't okay. found, found too much of a big problem. Oh. That was a really long way of saying that. <laughs> no, that's okay. Sorry. Right. <laughs> I appreciate it. Really 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 yeah. Because <laughs> yeah. right. it's always not good to know when it rolls out and it, it works perfectly, but it's always more interesting, in my opinion, to know when you actually want to know what block, what it takes to troubleshoot. Right. And, you know, besides just trying to find out, oh, the host is commuting and commuting back to, to your master and whatnot. Right, right. We've had issues working with Azure, but only, I, I think, the only reason for that is because there are several different moving pieces involved in getting Ansible to talk to Azure. Is it the authentication? Yeah, we're actually having an error with it right now. Um, so, so uh, Azure exposes everything through a REST API REST calls, right? And so there's a handful of Python libraries that wrap all the REST calls for Azure, and Ansible for Azure relies on them, and they get changed sometimes without Ansible knowing, and then things break. So the handshake is like, okay. Yeah, so we're having like SSL certificate errors. Um, if anyone happens to know anything about that, I'd be glad to talk to you. <laughs> Uh, but again, that's not an Ansible issue, that's more like middleware. And, and because it's an Azure, there's more middleware involved, and so there's more places where things can go, can, can work. So, but as far as the Windows stuff is concerned. Now, now most of the Windows, I think all the Windows modules are still in preview mode? No. The, no. The, about a year ago, they came out of preview. Oh, they did? Yeah. Because the documentation says that. It's so okay. That's cool. We'll fix it. Yeah. <laughs> so I thought they had exceptionally good, good working. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. So that's why, because they're part of core, so they work really well. They're very dependable. All right. Um. Actually, there's no other question that actually is a pretty good segue to bring Tim up here. Yeah. And you yeah. talk about actually the future development as well with Windows. Yes. And he's probably just gonna. <laughs> So, yeah, I'm not a Windows person, but I play one at a meetup. Um, I contacted our engineering, and I said, hey, I'm going to this meetup. And so our lead engineer of our Windows implementation wrote me a long note <laughs> they're going to try to read to what they're, they have coming. I think this answers one of your questions first. He said, big thing is that uh, Pi WinRM 0.3 gives HTTP messaging encryption for NTLN, Kerbos, and CRED SSP. So no need for HTTPS anymore. Um, I know he's been working with the maintainer of that Python library that we rely on closely, and they've been trying to fix that so it fixes Ansible. So I guess they got that going. Uh, he said that WinRM quick config at all will, should just work now. So that'll be 2.5, which is due out in March. Uh, right now, there's actually starting code freeze. Parts of, of the next version's already been frozen. There's still parts that are uh, modules that are open for uh, changes, but uh, we're starting to get there. Uh, let's see, what else? Win updates in 2.5 can automatically handle reboot cycling and batching. So if you have something with several rounds of patches, it'll just do it for you now. And now, uh, except whitelists and blacklists. Uh, gather subset is supported on Windows setup in 2.5, so you can speed it up. Excluding processor specs, make it run sub second. Let's see here. Windows becomes run as is much improved in 2.5. Uh, you can now become system without a password and do whatever the hell you want. Sorry, that was his quote. <laughs> uh, uh, and uh, we'll uh, auto elevate under UAC in nearly all circumstances now without exotic permissions. And then he goes on to say that they're looking at for version 2.6 and 2.7, they're starting to cloud out the roadmap for those versions. Um, looking at persistent connections, windows over SSH, auto tunneling for jump host bastion scenarios using PSRP, that is, but hopefully some of you do, instead of naked, in quotes, WinRM, possibly adding a suite of SQL Server management modules. Um, and then one other thing I can add is in our last release, we put a lot of changes into Azure. It's because the Microsoft Azure team 
is actually contributing those modules. So they're actually the ones working on them, and they're well aware of the problems you've pointed out and, <laughs> and have cursed it themselves because they've run into it. Yeah. Their own and developers. Was working in November. What's it? It was working in November. Yeah, they put a, we put a lot of effort over the summer into those, and, and they actually had a, a hackathon in Redmond. Where like four or five of their people sat down and cranked out 18 new modules for Azure, uh, and that's where they were cursing their own APIs. So <laughs> they're well aware of the problems, um, and hopefully they catch up to AWS. We want them to. We're working with them to the, but they're not quite there. Yeah, and that's understandable. Yeah. I mean, there's a big theme that they have. Amazon is a big theme. Yes, yes. It so that was what I had. That was almost as straight from the horse's mouth as you can get it from uh, our lead engineer on our Windows. Uh, I can try to answer any questions uh, while I'm here. But like I said, I don't come from a Windows background, so I was, if you couldn't tell, mostly reading what Matt sent me. <laughs> I will say that the, there is a Google group for Ansible users that has great support for Windows users. A lot yeah. of times Windows questions are some of the main topics on the user group. and. Uh, Huge community, yeah. along with Ansible developers and other people from Red Hat that help out and answer yeah. questions there. So if you're, you want to get your feet wet, that's a great place to find uh, other Windows users in the community. That, that, that's the Windows SIG? You're... No, just the random, just the Ansible users. Oh, yeah. yeah. We also have, I believe, there's a, some called a Windows SIG now. There's a oh, whole okay. bunch under, you have to go to github.com slash ansible slash community, mm -hmm. and there's a whole bunch of of uh, special interest groups, oh, okay. and I'm pretty sure there's a Windows one there now. Yeah. There's oh. like VMware, AWS, Azure. Nice. Yeah, but uh, yeah, just the, even the general users group is really great for yeah. On, on yeah. Google, so. yeah, usually Matt and the other people are hanging out in, in the Ansible IRC channel. Uh, they're on the West Coast. I don't know how many so Windows people know about IRC. But What's that? I don't know how many Windows guys <laughs> know about IRC. Yeah, I know. Yeah, we hear that too. But if you can, <laughs> if you can, they hang out there all the time. So where were you saying there was a good Oh, it's under uh, the community repository. Yeah, we have a repo just for our community stuff. It might be way down the list. Oh, it, there it is. Oh, there it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah towards the bottom. And then there are all these groups. There's, sorry, you can see where I'm pointing. I don't want to. Uh, yeah, the group windows. Whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> see group, yeah. Go. So there's some, yeah, there's Matt and Jordan, our two uh, engineers right on the top. Yeah. Okay, so they're sending people, they have a, an IRC channel just for Windows, it looks like they've set up now. And then they're, they're directing everyone to the Ansible develop mailing list if you want to use that. Uh, Matt and Jordan are two of our developers working directly on this stuff. And uh, if you hang out enough, you'll see these three names. I don't know if anyone's heard of Dag Weirs. I'm kind of surprised that he's uh, yeah. featuring in the Windows. So uh, yeah, uh, his, his day job forces him to. Huh. He actually gave a presentation at Ansible Fest in San Francisco about managing Windows desktops with Ansible. Wow. Uh, you can go find it on ansible.com slash, I think it's under videos, and then look for Ansible Fest San Francisco 2017, and you'll see Dag's name and uh, whole video of his presentation on that. Uh, yeah, his day job pays him to work on Ansible and Windows, so he does it. <laughs> nice. Well, thank you, Tim. Yeah. Any thanks. questions? Like, it's getting a little late, so uh, obviously we're everyone's time. But um, feel free to have some more pizza and uh, ask some questions while we clean up. And <coughs> hope you guys will join us again. And um, uh, like I said, feel free to reach out to any of the groups. Uh, you can email, send a message to the meetup group, and uh, we'd love to have everyone back. So thank you for coming. And thank you, Dan.